This is Jonathan Lane from Fan Film Factor, and today I'm here with Mr. Kurt Danhauser, who is the, I guess, the preeminent expert on Star Trek the Animated Series. He has a website. He has actually created his own animated Star Trek episodes as fan films. In fact, he's just released a brand new one starring Scotty. Welcome to Fan Film Factor, Kurt. Hi, thanks, Jonathan. Glad to be here. So, first of all, let's get a little bit of background on you. Obviously, you love Star Trek the Animated Series. Otherwise, you wouldn't have created this amazing website with all of this background information. So, how did that part of your life start? How did you get to be such an expert on the Animated Series? Good question, Jonathan. Basically, I grew up watching animated Star Trek and, and animated series in general. And I was kind of always artistic, so I always liked color and animation and stuff. So I was always drawn to that. I was born in 1962, so I actually remember watching the last couple of seasons of the original series live. And I remember getting a model of the D7 Klingon ship and actually ruining it because I did all the gluing myself one night instead of waiting for my dad, you know. So, so I actually was in, in the Star Trek, the original series, Long, long ago, and, and I remember one of my favorite books, was my first books was, was that I borrowed from my dad was The Making of Star Trek, you know, which actually came out between the second and third season. So I've been always looking at the blueprints of the ship and uh, loving the original series. And then the animated series came, which was awesome, you know, because I was 11 years old when it aired. And it was, this was brand new episodes with cool new characters and colorful stuff and plenty of ships and aliens. So it was just amazing. It was just amazing. I, I couldn't get enough of it. Fast forward to the 90s, you know, and all of a sudden there's the, the Internet. In the very beginning, you know, every, all the pages were just gray, which was just a giant picture that took forever to load. And there were Star Trek home pages and they had some stuff. And then I didn't see anything on the animated Star Trek. You know, I used to program the Apple line of computers in Macintosh. So I actually had a Mac LC back in 92. Anyway, and had a video spigot so I could actually capture images. So I actually hooked that up to video, my, my VHS videos, of the animated series, and I actually captured some horrible grainy pictures. But I was able to basically take those pictures and manipulate them in Photoshop, and I just made a website, you know, based on all the material that's in the show. And, of course, I had a few reference books, and also I just knew a lot about the show, and, and I, I could add things to the site, things that were in the episodes that referred to other things in the Star Trek universe, so I could describe that, you know. So I knew a lot of stuff, and then I started, over the years, adding things to it. Because, you know, basically back in the 70s when there was very little Star Trek, there was just Star Trek New Voyages, the little two books. There was James Bush novelizations, and they also had the only original, uh, the first original story, Spock Must Die, James Bush also. So there was just a handful of things out there. But there was a number of books and things like that that talked about the animated series a little bit here and there. And there's also, you know, magically the catalog number seven, I believe it was, that had a treatment. And that was where a lot of the information came from, because it actually had the making of the animated Star Trek. So I basically use that as a resource and other things. So I basically added material. And then eventually, Fred Bronson, who actually was the NBC publicist for the animated Star Trek, and also he was the NBC publicist for Questor, a Gene Roddenberry show that was gonna, mm-hmm. uh, that uh, had a pilot. So anyway, Fred Bronson wrote the last episode of the animated Star Trek under the pseudonym of uh, John Culver. So I basically just found out through one of the uh, Star Trek, I think it was the Encyclopedia by Michael D. Sakuda and Debbie Myrak. But basically, in one of the references in there, they actually mentioned that, I don't know what, how it was in there, but Bronson was actually writing under the pseudonym of John Culver. I hadn't heard of Fred Bronson before. So I basically added to my website John Culver, who was actually Fred Bronson. So interestingly, you know, in 1997 or and then six or whatever, not long after the site was up, Fred Bronson is eagle surfing, you know, searching for his own name on the web and finds the website. So he gives me an email. So he tells me a little bit about this Fred Bronson guy, and, I go, and he says, hey, how do I know so much about Fred Bronson? Because I am Fred Bronson. So we connected, <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, it was, it was really cool. So we eventually met down at the, um, in Los Angeles, you know, at the Daily Grill, and a number of times we, you know, talked and stuff like that, because, you know, he had been uh, in the Star Trek world. And starting out long ago, and he was actually David Gerald's boyfriend uh, way back in the day, so. Oh, well, that's interesting. And, yeah. I know that David Gerald worked on the animated series a little oh, yeah. bit as well. He had a couple of episodes. Exactly. Oh, yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. He did. He wrote some episodes, and he actually he did some voices, lent some voice to some characters. So he wrote some episodes, and one of them was a uh, fourth season original series script, More Trouble, uh, or More Troubles, More, wait. More, more troubles, troubles, More Troubles. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Nice. I'm 
tripling over my own lips here. So, yeah. Yeah, so he wrote that, and, and actually a, a number of, of other scripts uh, that were made into animated would have been third or fourth series episodes. If, that, if I remember correctly, didn't David Gerald write the episode Bem? Yes, Buckeye Monster, Bem. And right. Bem, if I remember correctly, was the first time that we ever discover that Kirk's middle name is Tiberius. That's right, that's right. I don't know when it became canon, probably in Star Trek VI or something like that. Uh, it became canon, that is, if you don't consider the animated series canon. But yes, there's a number of firsts in the animated. The first holodeck was in there. The secondary exit on the bridge was in the animated series and quite a number of other things. Robert April, the very first captain of the Enterprise and his wife and medical officer, Sarah. We just kind of went a number of times in the series they mentioned the first ship with warp drive or first modern ship with warp drive, modern warp drive, whatever. That was mentioned a number of times in that episode. Actually, that episode was written by Fred Bronson. That was um, Counterclock, is it? Anyway, in that one, they actually... um, she, she said, oh, as the medical officer of the first ship of warp drive, you know, I had to improvise all the time, whatever. So it's like, well, wait a minute. If the Enterprise, NCC 1701, was the first ship of warp drive, well, then was it built before the Constitution? And not only that, what about all the ships that came before? It wasn't the first one of warp drive. But anyway, yeah. it, it was one of those things that's difficult to say anything because you don't expect that literally hundreds of episodes are going to come afterward and potentially contradict your timeline. So. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the animated series, I sort of feel like it's selective canon. You know, in my mind, Robert April was the first captain of the Enterprise before Pike. In my mind, yes, Spock grew up in Shakar City on Vulcan. This was established before the fourth season of of Star Trek Enterprise. He had a pet Salot. We always knew that from Journey of Abel. But as far as I'm concerned, the Salot's name was Achaya. He was killed by a Lobachla in the Langan foothills. So how about that? You're not the only expert on Star Trek, the animated series trivia. But that being said, you know, yes, there are some things in the animated series that are absolutely cringeworthy. And you just have to kind of, you know, you you take the good with the bad, I think, a little bit. And for the most part, these were fun episodes you know there was a holodeck on the enterprise before there was ever a holodeck on the enterprise because the wreck deck in practical joker you know and of course that almost killed them because you know the temperature was turned down and apparently you could turn down the temperature on a starship enough to freeze people well the safeties were off the uh, computer was just having some fun with them you know and it it controlled safety and it basically you know did whatever it wanted which was like you know not bueno for someone who doesn't have fur and then, of course, in the exact same episode, the Enterprise apparently can launch a decoy balloon of itself that's about six times that's larger right, than the actual right. Starship. So, yeah, you know, it was created for kids. I mean, that's we all right, know it was right. created for kids. But, you know, then there were the couple of really, really good episodes, like Yesteryear, which even though Spock was a seven-year-old kid, if you were a kid watching it, you know, you were oh, yes. dealing with the death of a pet. You yep. were dealing with being bullied. I mean, it was a hard episode, you know, in a lot of ways to watch. And and then Slaver Weapon, of course. Oh, yeah. Love that. That was an awesome Larry Niven uh, adapted oh, episode. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then you had episodes like The Infinite Vulcan, which, like, nobody can figure out. Oh, yes, yes. Well, it's <laughs> interesting. I think The Infinite Vulcan, because they had animation, they, they could just make him giant. So he didn't have to be giant. It could have been just a, a regular story in which, you know, there's, there's these eugenics guys, you know, Stavros Caniculeos is, is, you know, looking for this great person, you know, and, and kind of like Spock's brain, they're looking for a brain because they want to use it for something. They were looking for this perfect specimen, you know, to help him with, with his eugenics program. But the fact that they cloned him into a giant, it, that was just visual fun, you know. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the huge inflatable enterprise. It could have been a normal-sized enterprise, and, you know, like, like a Mylar balloon. You deploy it and you actually inflate it. Interestingly, you know, I was actually in the United States Navy years and years ago in the 80s, and one of the things, I was an electronic warfare officer, so one of the things that a ship could actually do is deploy what they call a rubber duck. And it actually was, you dump it over the side, it would inflate, and it had corner reflectors on it. So when, from a distance, missile coming over the horizon looking at your ship or this rubber duck, the rubber duck, because the way the angle reflectors are done, it has the same radar cross-section as a full-size cruiser. So it actually has an analog in real life. You actually can the deployable. Or it's like launching a cloud of chaff, which is uh, metalized strips cut to a certain length so that when it's a cloud in the air, it actually looks like it gives you the same return of a ship. 
So a missile, if it's not very smart, it can actually go right for the shaft or for the rubber duck and avoid you. So basically what that was was really a diversionary tactic. And the fact that it was, like, bigger than the Enterprise, that was kind of a little bit crazy. That, that's a lot. I mean, even if it was Mylar, it would be really difficult to kind of make that thing ejected and inflated quickly. But, you know, it was one of those things. It was fun, and they decided to make it huge. And it could have just been, like, you know, some other – ship or something like that it didn't have to be, you know, a giant version of it. But anyways, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, me, I mean, kids love when things get really, really big or yeah. really, really small, like, it's, you know, the Terrigen incident on the I Shrunk the Crew. Uh, exactly. You know. Well, exactly, and it's visually interesting, you know. And when you can do that, it's great. But otherwise, this is one thing that they were able to do in the anime series, you know. And they did it a number of times. They didn't do it that many times. But they actually could take liberties and do things they could never have done with a, a regular budget. You know, so they can have, like, all kinds of aliens. They can do an alien ship or several uh, alien ships of the week, you know, which you can never do. I mean, the original series, even though, you know, people remember, oh, the Klingon ship. Went on. Well, the Klingon ship didn't show up as a Klingon ship until the third or fourth episode of the third season. The Klingon ship first appeared as a Romulan ship in, in a Yep. Ship. And it's insane. You know, people think, oh, the Klingon ship. No, nope, we never saw it. It was a glowing ball in the distance in the first two seasons. It's like... Wow. Yep. The first time we ever saw the glowing ball of Klingon yeah. ship, I believe, was Friday's Child, and it's yeah. just sort of, you know, hovering there, and you don't really see yeah. it. If, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, since, since you are a, a purveyor of, of background information like no other, is it true that the reason that they used the Klingon model, which had been filmed already, I think they had built that yeah. for um, a lot of Troyers or something like that, uh, but mm-hmm. they used the Klingon model for the Enterprise into is that somebody stepped on the Romulan model? Well, I've heard that recently. Um, I don't know if that's correct. I think what it was is it was misplaced. I heard it was misplaced. But either way, I think it was still a good idea to use that one. And it was filmed, I believe, after the, uh, a lot of choice. But it was, they, you know, they basically filmed them and they aired them how, in whatever order. But at that time, they would be working on an episode in uh, pre-production and they would be working on an episode filming it. Uh, you know, they would be writing one episode filming another, editing another, and then basically releasing another one. So they would be in a pipeline. But at the beginning, they would have a number of episodes in the works, and they could actually they would have three or four of them, and they could actually release which one, whichever one they want. But then soon, they would basically use up those, and they would then be at the one-a-week thing, which is insane to think. I mean, we talk about, you know, you see all these shows, and you now you have all the special effects and everything, and they have, you know, have all the time to put into that. But back in the day, these shows were made one a week. They were releasing one brand new episode a week, and they couldn't stumble, or else they would not air an episode that week. It's been crazy. It's almost like the days of live television. But this was a very sophisticated show, which required elaborate special effects, and they basically employed every special effects house in L.A., literally, every special effects house, because they weren't, like, busy making Star Wars or anything like that. They were doing special effects for Lost in Space and other things, but basically uh, Star Trek was employing all the special effects houses. So they really were balls to the walls. They could not stumble. So basically, they have to say, well, let's air this one as our season opener for third season, and then thus the Enterprise incident was the first time we saw the Klingon ship. But in retrospect, when we look back, we go, oh, yeah, all the Klingon ships we see, you know. Well, we didn't see them until third season, which is crazy. Very, very clever that they always had the Klingon ships just out of um, a sense of range. In fact, you know, one of the things that I very much enjoyed when they did the remasters, even though they were trying to be as as loyal to the original special effects shots, is mm-hmm. that in Errand of Mercy, they actually did throw in some D7 ships in that, because that was one of the things that was really missing in that episode. But, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, but, but you're right. I mean, they were putting together so many visual effects. I mean, even if it's yeah, all yeah, yeah. the same uh, 20 shots of the Enterprise getting closer to a planet, yeah, yeah. leaving the planet, Enterprise turning, Enterprise firing phasers, they, well, they, they were so busy yeah, doing all that stuff that to you know, have an episode late in the season that says, oh, yeah, we need to have a, a war between yeah. a fleet of Klingon vessels and a fleet of Starfleet vessels. And you know, there's like That's right. somebody in the line producer budget office saying, no, we're not doing that. No, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, it's amazing how much, how budget conscious these shows are. I mean, jumping to another show, uh, Batman, for instance, you know, that was on for three seasons, and I think it was on ABC, and then they basically they were approached by CBS and said, hey, you know, we'll, because they were pitching it to other seasons, um, networks, and then CBS says, hey, you know, we'll take you, and, uh, you know, Batman uh, producers, whatever, they said, oh, shoot, we just struck all our sets, you know, including the Batcave, and it'll cost us to rebuild, and they go, well, never mind then. So literally, because they had, they had taken that set down, 
there wasn't a fourth season of Batman, which could have been. Just like Wonder Woman went from ABC to CBS or whichever one it was, CBS to ABC, uh, that thing happened. It could have happened with Batman, except that, well, they'd have to rebuild the set. It's like, wow. It's all budget. It's all budget. Um, Batman, the original series, they actually had a, a bat boat and a bat copter. Like, they could never afford those for, for a TV series. And they could afford the standing sets. They had to justify them. And they had a special budget for pilots, so they actually could build something for the pilot, but they can't go crazy. They can build, like, uh, the back cave and things like that, and then those would be standing sets for the series. But they also have a separate budget for the pilot separate from the series. But once the series was in play, then you only had so much money. You could say, well, this episode will go three times of the budget. Well, no, you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that very often. You can do a model episode where you can save some money by not having any guest stars, no extra sets, things like that. And then you could maybe afford a little more expensive. But they could never afford the bat copter or the, the bat boat. But what they decided to do is on a hiatus between the first and second season, they made a movie, which actually is huge because they could sell it in Europe. Because Europe, at the time, they didn't have a market to send episodes. In the 60s, Europe would just have show movies. You know, So shows like Man from Uncle and things like that would edit together some episodes and throw some spicy bits in like Yvonne Craig. Um, they had some extra scenes of her being sexy, and they released them as two-hour movies, a number of those. The same thing, they actually made a Batman movie, and because of that, it was a whole different budget. And actually, in the budget of that, they actually built the Batcopter and the Batboat just for that movie. And, of course, once it's built, guess what? They can use it for the series. So they do all kinds of tricks. Back then, they were so budget-bound. So I didn't even go on and on and on. But all these things are interconnected. That's one of the great things about the animated series, or uh, the potential, is they can show anything. They can have Crazy Planet, you know, and they can have aliens, like the Philosians, which were in that um, Infinite Vulcan. It was in, in, impossible to do. Impossible. Actual tentacles moving around instead of arms. Uh, that kind of stuff was just amazing, and that's one of the things that pulled me in when I was a kid, is I love Star Trek. And new episodes and new ships, I mean, the new Aqua Shuttle, the Scouter Gig, the robot-controlled grain ships, the Bottom Adventure. I just went insane as a kid. I was a blueprint kid, you know. I, I loved the blueprints, you know. And I, and yeah, I was too. Oh, yeah, I used to draw ships all the time. It was just, you know, that's what 12, 13, I 10. I doodled them on my homework all through high school. Of course. <laughs> so finally, I get to your answer of your question. It was that. It was Star Trek Plus. It was for a 14 or 11-year-old. It was Star Trek on crack, you know. All these ships, all this fantastic stuff, and it was just... It was awesome. So I've always had a passion for Star Trek and the animated series. And then when I made the website, I basically just put those in and said, you know, I want to do this website thing, so I just figured it out. I'll go ahead and learn HTML. I do my own website, so I did. And from there on, it just took off, and I just kept adding more and more information as I found it. You know, I got some information from Fred Bronson and then from other people, and then other people would write in. Like, for instance, I talked to uh, Billy Simpson, who you just mentioned earlier, a seven-year-old clock that was actually voiced by Billy Simpson. And we emailed back and forth, and I basically added information from his interview to the site. Like, for instance, he was auditioning for the role of Young Clark. So they said, hey, here, read these lines, you know, and then he basically gave him some sides, obviously, some, some lines to read. And those lines were basically all the dialogue that Young Clark was supposed to say. So he basically recorded different readings of them. He sent it in, and they go, hey, you got the job. And then he says, oh, great, great. When do I come in and record it? And they go, well, actually, your recordings for this audition were good enough. We're just going to use them. So they cut him a check. So it's like he never went in and recorded his <laughs> lines. All his lines were his audition. It's like, how awesome is that? You know, again, budget, too. So he told me his story and a number of people I contacted. Sadly, Russell Bates, you know, he passed away very recently. Um, I didn't get a chance to meet him in person, but I emailed him a lot because I was actually working on an animated version of Patient Parasites, which is, of course, the Star Trek story that he originally pitched, you know, as an animated series episode. He was basically a friend of Gene Alcoon who was his mentor. Also, he knew Dorothy C. Fontana. So basically, he was invited and said, hey, why don't you submit something? Well, he goes, hey, cool. So he submitted a story. It was a really good story, but it was much more akin to a original series episode or a filmed episode than an animated one, which just means that it just wasn't as zowie in terms of all the graphics and all the stuff you can do with it. As Dorothy said, it didn't lend itself to the animated medium as much as it could have. So he wrote another one with David Weiss, who, again, passed away not too long ago, and then, of course, that was the Emmy Award winning How Sharp Are That Assurance Too? And that was a very, very good episode. In that one, of course, he introduces the character of Ensign Dawson Walking Bear. Of course, I've used him on some animations. But he actually was originally in that Patient Parasite script. And then um, later on, he was approached by the people, I think, Sandra Marshak and Myrna Culpreff. They collected the short story books, Dr. New Voyages in 76 and Star Trek New Voyages 2 in, like, 77. 
And in the second one, it actually printed Russell Bates' script. And, of course, at that time, he just changed it to Sulu instead of Doth the Walking Bear for whatever reason, because I think he wanted to, because it really didn't use the Native American nature of that character enough. So he said, well, I'll just make it Sulu. So basically, he printed that script. Of course, I read that script as a young kid going, it's awesome, you know. And then later on, I was emailing back and forth with Russell Bates because he basically was helping me with this uh, website, the stuff that had to do with his episode. And he basically said, hey, you know, if you'd like, you know, you could produce it. You know, this was later when I started making animated episodes. I said, well, that'd be awesome. So I literally collaborated with him on the script for The Patient Parasites because what I did is I actually added a little bit of framing material to it. I changed the setting so it wasn't just a desert planet, you know, which is very visually uninteresting. Of course, it's the staple of every show, you know, in Lost in Space, Star Trek. They beam down to a planet, there's just some gray rocks and a bunch of brown dirt, and then a cyclorama, you know, with a different colored screen or sky behind it, and that's basically every planet you've ever been to. Because it's, it's right. filmable on the budget. But for animated, you can make anything. Well, let's get back to your website, obviously, yes. which is amazing, and you've got so much information there. But one of the things that's very unique about your website and the reason that you're here on Fan Film Factor is that in addition to putting out stuff about the existing 22 episodes of the animated series, yeah. you created a few of your own, yeah. which is very impressive. Yeah, you have you have three episodes, if I remember correctly. Yes. Let's see, you have The Element of Surprise with the uh, interesting yeah. girl with the purple face. And let the heavens fall, and your very, very ambitious multi-part episode, yeah. Ptolemy Wept, which is yeah. up there in uh, what is it, nine parts? Yes, yeah. and it's like uh, I how long it is. I always forget how long it is. I think it's like forty-nine minutes. Yeah, there's an interesting story about each of those. The first one, I don't remember if I had originally written the script before the DVD came out or not. DVD came out in 2006, okay, of Enemy Star Trek, which means I actually could gather very good images. You know, in other words, I could screen capture images from uh, DVD on my Mac. And I had a script. So what I did is I did a proof of concept. So that, um, I was on a Mac, and I had iMovie. This was back in uh, January of 2007. I did a proof of concept, which was like a minute long or whatever, or not a minute long, maybe like three seconds long. So what it was, it had an opening, it faded in, and it had some ship scenes, and then it had an overview of the bridge, and it had some shots where Kirk says and Spock say things. I basically wanted to figure out how to lip sync. I wanted to figure out how to do screen capture images and then render them with new lip sync. I wanted to do that. And then once I was done, I had a friend who could actually master the DVD. So I, I didn't want to create the thing and then turn out that this was kind of before YouTube. I don't think YouTube was really a thing. It was. It kind of was, but that wasn't my main thing. I was originally just going to do a, a short a half-hour episode and maybe release it on DVD and give it to friends, you know, just, just for friends. And then when I did that, I wanted to make sure that I could put it out on the DVD, put it into a DVD player and on a TV screen, have it look okay, you know, because if it looked like crap, I wasn't going to do it because it, it is really horrible. To me. So, so I did a proof of concept, and then I said, what the heck? So then I just started working on it. And I had three daughters, and they were very young, and they were born in 1990, 1992, and 2000. So I had these three kids, and I was married, and I had a full-time job, and everything like that. So it was very, very busy. But I basically don't sleep a lot. You know, I can just get along with very little sleep. I stay up late and everything. So I basically started doing more of this animation. And then bit by bit, I was able to put it together. At the time, it was called Playing God originally. But then I kind of gave everything away. So I said, well, I'll call it and let them fall. So I was working on this Let the Heaven Fall thing, and I was waiting until the whole thing was done. I was going to release it. I, I didn't want to do the whole thing in parts because, you know, how you, you, I think um, Exeter, Starship Exeter, had released some awesome episodes or, or pieces, and they hadn't done the, the final one. Unfortunately, because people were waiting, and I was thinking, well, I don't know if I want to do that because let's say something happens, I, I'm not able to release it for a long time. What do, you know? So I wanted to release the whole thing at once. So I actually had, you know, a bunch of stuff done, and then I heard that Starship Farragut, they were going to do animated episodes, and I was like, what? And they actually asked me for a little help. They actually lent some uh, backgrounds to it. Anyway, so uh, and I was like, wait a minute. And it was like being touted as the first animated Star Trek. I'm going, oh, shoot, you know, because I'm actually waiting to release mine. You know, and I'm going to be beaten to the punch. So I said, well, that's no fun because, you know, really, I've been working on it for, for years. So I think this was like 2000. It was, it was early 2000 or mid-2008. Anyway, so what I did is I said, wait a minute. So I wrote a short so the element of surprise basically came, so I wanted to have the, the I wanted to, to scoop them, you know, in other words, be the first one to have an animated episode. Because I actually had one almost waiting in the wings, and then they were going to release their first part before I had my whole one done. But I said, well, that's not really fair for me. So um, it's great for them because they wanted to do it, and it was awesome. 
and I really enjoyed those. So anyway, so, so I did the element of surprise, and I said, why not just make a little tongue-in-cheek kind of a thing, you know? So I refactored a lot of the scenes I had, and I basically just created this character that basically just tells the entire story of the episode because she sees it all ahead of time. <laughs> and then I just had her, you know, be silly and just kind of said, well, if that's the case, I'll go ahead and just solve the problem now. It, it's kind of funny. <laughs> you know, originally, all these were embedded in my website, so that's how people watch them. But then people started watching them, you know, just in YouTube, you know, because later on, you know, people just watching YouTube, and they're like, oh, my God, Kirk wouldn't do that. I said, well, geez, if you watched it embedded in my site, which, you know, they don't have to, but they would have then seen on my disclaimer saying, obviously, you wouldn't do this. But um, it was just kind of a fun little thing. Yeah, so, it's and still, film, for goodness sake. Yeah, exactly. Well, when I watch it, I still chuckle. Every time uh, Kirk says, you know, well, and that's different. You know, and he does what he does. It's just so out of left field and kind of fun. So I did the element of surprise. Uh, and, and you beat Farragut by a few months. Yeah, apparently. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think yours was, like, July 2008. And I yeah. think Farragut's first animated episode was end of 2008. Or early 2009, yeah, yeah. they had two of them, and their I think their second yeah. one actually had Chase Masterson and Tim Rust, I think. In it. Yes, definitely. Yes, exactly. That was those were very good. Yeah, it was fun helping a little bit out on that. They did it a different way, and it was really great because my um, colleague on the internet, Kale Tescar, he worked with them significantly on it, and uh, he also has an animated Star Trek website. So you know, we basically you know not stepped on each other's toes in terms of websites, like I don't know how embedded puzzles and things like that. I and mean, he doesn't have elaborate episode guys. So it's kind of cool that we... Yeah, actually, I, I, I want to interrupt here for a second because oh, I was sure. going to ask you about Kale Tescar. Uh, so, yeah. yes, the other major animated Star Trek website is his, Star yeah. Trek Animated Yes. Yeah. And yeah. what's very interesting I've determined is that the two of you, you don't step on each other's toes. No. You have so much background information. He has a lot of fan art, uh, for example. Yeah. You both have episode yeah. information. He has the puzzles. You, you almost like split the room down the middle, and you took this half, and he took that half. That's Did right. you That's guys right. actually start out? determining, like, okay, you're going to get custody of these kids and I'm going to get custody of these kids, or did it just sort of happen well, I that think, way? I think basically there's my sandbox kind of there, and then he did his website, and it was awesome, and he basically he did another site, which basically also had a bunch of animated Star Trek stuff, and he actually had better screen captures. So even to this day, the site's been up for 24 years, you know, my animated Star Trek stuff. But I haven't gone back and upgraded the imagery, because, I mean, there's basically, I don't know how many dozens and dozens of pages in my site, you know, I have all these pages that click the other pages, the other pages, you know, there's all, all the episodes. Yeah, your, your your website is these. totally locked in time. I mean, you go there yeah. and you're oh, yeah, basically yeah, yeah, yeah. seeing the Internet of 20 years ago, which is, yeah. uh, I, I find it wonderful because, you know, that's when I was designing websites was in the mid-1990s to, you know, the early 2000s, and that's the kind of that's the kind of Internet we had back when I was young, when we were walking up out of school in the snow both directions. We loved it. I kind of embrace the design motif. It's kind of like uh, the original series. It's like comparing what Discovery or some of the other shows do in terms of, you know, what Kirk's Enterprise would have looked like. I mean, Kirk's Enterprise was in the 60s, yes, but it was clean, had clean lines. So it didn't have to be a bunch of bumpy things that if you walked wrong, you would cut yourself on the corridor, you know. In other words, it, it was very, you know, utilitarian and militaristic, but it was realistic. In other words, there were these curved corridors and they were clean. There wasn't a bunch of junk and it wasn't, very, very dark and all kinds of lens flare. You know, it's a very simple, a very clean line, like the original Enterprise. It was very clean lines. And then later on, when they did some other ships, like Star Wars, for instance, when they came out, they were covered with nurnies, you know, all these different little, they get kit bashed and they have much detail, which is a whole different look. But the Enterprise was, was so sleek and it was, Matt Jefferson had such a clean design aesthetic. So my websites are very, very simple, very clean lines, and, and then the buttons are kind of obvious, and there's not a a bunch of embedded stuff. There isn't crazy rollovers that get annoying. It's just very, very clean. It's almost like a very elaborate PDF you're looking at with color and things like that. It's like a book or something, like when you look at the pages. It's not made to be crazy, up-to-date graphics and stuff like that. It's, it's, and then, you know, it's, 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 it's like, very cleanly organized. You know, my, yeah. my other life as a web developer was also as an information yeah. architect. In terms of information architecture, you know, you okay. have what you need. You can find it easily. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I very much enjoy your site. For, for folks who don't know, I've actually been trying to get Kurt on an interview for years. Because uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've watched your stuff, uh, and I've enjoyed oh, yeah. it. And now, finally, you told me wept was, I think, almost a decade ago. Uh, at this point, and since then, well, you've been started, putting, yeah, 2011. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And since then, you've been putting out a number of these little short you know, PSA, public service announcements, which were kind of fun. But it wasn't until very recently, the last, yeah. you know, week or two, uh, that you've released your first yeah. animated fan film in a long time. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Like, I did the first one, and then I did the second one. And, and it's part of my background is um, while I was doing these new episodes and stuff like that, I was going through things in my life. Let the Heavens Fall, I released it, you know, the last one in uh, 2009, Everything's Fine. And then I started uh, working on part one and part two of uh, Ptolemy Wept, right, in September 2011. Now, in um, May of 2012, uh, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, like we go, what the heck? Cancer, shoot. Oh, it's stage four. Oh, wow. So that's like what? Uh, uh, how much time do we have? And they go, oh, well, three to five years. Well, it turned out it was seven. It was um, 14 months from the time that she was diagnosed. So basically it was like really, really quick. My life was completely turned upside down. And she eventually passed away in July of 2013. And oh, I'm man, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah, single dad. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just it's unimaginable. I hope you never understand what it is like. So basically, she passes away, and I'm basically like, okay, great. Now i got these three kids, and, you know, two of them were in their 20s, which is great, and I have 13-year-olds. And else. So basically, I rebuild my life. But one thing that helps grief, and this is something people who, who ever have grief, whatever, find something that you're passionate about. Find something that occupies your mind. If you sit in an empty room, like in the Twilight episode, when uh, Edward left Bella alone, she just sat there all those months, you know, she was just all bummed out, screaming and crying. Well, that's what's going to happen if you just sit there and don't occupy yourself. So I, I threw myself into animation. I animated like crazy. So I threw myself into that animated, and um, you see there's a, for January 2013, there's a, a release there. Well, basically, that was almost ready to be released. It's just that I stopped doing everything. I stopped doing my bills for six months. I stopped doing everything. I basically just took care of her, and I went to work and as much as I could, and I basically just, you know, survived. So then I uh, threw myself into animation, and then boom, 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 I got a lot of animation done, and it literally was, uh, I, I would say if it saved me, you know, I, I'm a strong person. I would have been destroyed, but it so distracted me that I was able to, time passed without me being really, really pulled into the abyss, you know. If you can distract yourself, distract yourself, distract yourself for months on end and still keep the fires burning, you know, and, and take care of your kids and your job, well, then that's how you survive, grief like that. So I did that. So that's why it, it took so long for Tell Me Web to finally get done. Yeah, because this is for people to know. So you started in 2011, but your last episode didn't yes. come out until, let's see, May 10th, 2016. Wow. And that was the last part of Tell Me Wept. And I'm looking here, and it looks like you, you came out initially in 2011, and then you had a few parts in 2013 and 2014. There was yeah. one in 2015, and the last two were 2016. So I mean, it sounds like yeah. you were definitely you know pushing yourself forward yeah. as well as you could. Yeah, and what was crazy also is I was, this is, and I don't suggest this to anybody, but basically I had written Tall New Webs, and I had been kicking the story around while I was doing the first one and Let the Heavens Fall. So I had this idea, you know, and I had the thing written, except I didn't have the end of Act 4, and I didn't have Act 5 written at all. So I figured, oh, I'll just write those, you know, as I'm animating. So I, I animate everything. And, of course, when I finally get around to writing those, and it, you can actually tell as it's going on, it's sometimes it's kind of like, wait a minute, this is kind of dragging on a little bit because it was done in all these different pieces. And it never existed originally as just one entire script, and then I started animating it. I was writing it as I was animating it. When I came to the point where I had the last several parts to do, I wrote Act 5, and it turned out it was a lot more elaborate. I'm thinking, oh, my, look at all this stuff. Act 5 is crazy. It's so long. So I just said, well, I have to do it. So I just kept animating and finally finished it. And I finished it in May 2016. And I actually expected, well, that would be it. Because I like doing different things, and I was taking all move on to other things. But I just love animation so much that I had to do something. So then I did some smaller animations, like I have a website for Star Trek Story Records. And just for kicks, I did four of those, you know, where I actually used the comics with the sound, just so I put some things out. So I wanted some things to come out every month or so. So I did that, and I did PSAs, you know, the public service announcement. That was one thing that the original series didn't have other than one that was uh, pollution-related that came out after the series. But I actually created public service announcements, epilogues, which tells, you know, a lesson at the end. So I made these as if they were in the 70s. So I made, like, uh, nine of them just for fun. And then I said, eh, maybe I'll just do all of them. So I started, I made a bunch of them, all the rest of them, all 22 of them. So I did that. And then I did some Klingon ones just for kicks because I was toying around with the idea of making a Klingon story. Actually, I have a Klingon story with Kang in mind. And then um, I still do, but I don't know if I'm going to do it or not. Anyway, so I did some Klingon stuff, 
and I actually got with a person online who was a Klingon translator, and then I translated them, so I actually put out Klingon versions of them just for fun, you know. So I did a number of these things to keep myself busy and animating it, because for a while I couldn't release a part because, you know, maybe there's 70 scenes. In animation, scenes are anytime you change the camera position. A scene would be like from two to six seconds. A shot is basically a scene in animation. So I have like 50 or 70 scenes or whatever to do, and maybe there's some scene that requires me to create this background or this new graphic, whatever, that takes a long time. You know, if I can't and I don't get that graphic done, I can't finish that scene or that part. So that happened a lot. That's actually one of the things that took me so long to get the part of Totally Webbed out is that I had to create the space station. All the internal views of the space station look like I didn't do those uh, for a while. So because I didn't have them, I couldn't have that part. Uh, the parts afterwards went a lot quicker because a lot of them took place on the existing Enterprise background, and I could do those very quickly. And even just modifying some things I had, it was easier to create the backgrounds for the later parts than for like part two or three or whatever. So because I wasn't able to release a part for many months sometimes, I said, well, geez, I'll put something out there you know, so people can watch something. So I did some more PSAs. And then I got the idea of doing the logic PSAs. And those are just all kinds of fun. At first, I based them in sets that I already had backgrounds for, like the transporter room, things like that. And I used you know, the characters that we already had, the cells and stuff like that. And then it took off, and I just continued doing those. And then eventually I finished Colony West in 2016. In the middle of all this, sometime after my first wife passed, I started going out there and meeting people. Because, you, know, you know, just like in Shawshank Redemption, you know, it's like get busy living or get busy dying, you know. So I had a lot of love to give. I wanted to move forward and, and have a life now. I wanted to share my life with somebody. So I, I would meet people and date and stuff like that. And then luckily, I literally finished Tell Me About the Last Scene on May 10th. And then three days later, I was connected with this fantastic woman, Melinda, who is now my wife. And then uh, two years later, we married. So we've been married for uh, coming up on two years in June. So Congratulations. Happy. Yes, yes. So that's another reason I kind of wanted to finish animating, and then that way I could not occupy all my time doing animation. So I wasn't going to do any big project. So then I was doing all these many, many uh, logic lessons. Now there's 24 of them. And so I put it all out, you know, I think, you know, maybe I could just do a short, you know, do something that's not too long, you know, 7, 10, 12 minutes. So I wrote this story that has Scotty in it. So I wrote for the Quintain, you know, and originally it was going to be only like 280 scenes, you know. So it was going to be like, I don't know, 15, 18 minutes long. And then I looked at it and I go, well, so then I said, well, let me add some scenes here that kind of flesh out a Scotty a little bit, just some background, some character stuff, you know, just so the plot stuff has a little bit more emotional underpinnings. So I did that. I wrote those scenes. And I actually added like 130 scenes. And it's like, oh, great. So originally I was like 80% done. And then I added all these scenes, so that slows me down. And, of course, then, now when I look at it, it actually is a full episode. So it's like, what the? I wasn't going to do any more animation than, than I ended up doing one. But it's a labor of love. I really, really love it. And I like animating in particular because there's always something that needs to be done. I don't always have to work on writing. I, I can work on recording dialogue or lip syncing. I can also Photoshop new frame sets, uh, characters against the background. And I can create new special effects graphics and stuff like that. You know, there's always something that can be done. So maybe I'm not in the mood to do some Photoshop, well then I'll do some dialogue recording, I'll do some lip sync or stuff like that. But usually it's the uh, Photoshop is what I, I really like. I like the graphics. I've been doing uh, Photoshop since 1994. So I just love it, you know, doing it for many, many years. A lot of hobbies, you know, like a you know, taxidermy hobby or something, you can't just sit down and go, let me just taxiderm a uh, squirrel's leg for 20 minutes, you know, and then go off. Hey, you can't do that. You know, you can't break things down in so you can sit down and literally do a half hour of work on a project you know, or a hobby. You can do that with animation. I can sit there and actually sweeten a scene and, and modify the background of some scene or whatever you know, in Photoshop and then you have to do something in a half hour or an hour. Or I can also sit down and work for nine hours straight. You know? So it's really something that I, I'm always able to get things done. And I'm working on a number of plays. I, I wrote a, a short play last year. I've worked on, I have half of a play written already. Uh, I want to finish it this year. I, I want to do some, some, a little bit of painting. But I do a lot of different things, but animation, I can just sit down on my computer and do some little work all the time, whereas I can't sit down and do 30 minutes of painting. You know, it didn't take that long to set everything up and put, take it down. So in a way, it pulls me in because it's seductive. Hey, Kurt, don't write, don't paint, don't sculpt, you know, don't read, don't ever. Just, just sit down and animate, you know, animate a few more scenes. You know, so it, it pulls me in. I, I start doing those shorts, and I'll pull it to do this one. So... I don't know if this is going to be my last one or not. You know, I actually have two more stories, which I think are really, really 
would be very, very interesting. It would, would go over very well. And I want to write them this year just to write them. But if I do, I'll probably animate them. But they're very, very elaborate, very elaborate. And there's another story that – well, whatever. I, I have several stories in the works, uh, just like to say. I think mean, I have, like, 12 different stories, several of which are already in the beat outline stage completed. It's just I have a script. So there's a number of stories. I think, I think they'd be pretty interesting. And the two I'm working on I think would be visually interesting and also just kind of cool, maybe cooler than – I don't know, as cool or maybe a little bit cooler than the one that worked out. So one story, actually, I hinted at in Tall New West, you know, where the Metrons actually capture them. I didn't really need to have the Metrons in there. Uh, spoiler alert, the Metrons are in Tall New West if you haven't watched the uh, episode. Oh, well. <laughs> well, there you go. You yeah, spoiled like, it now. Years. Yeah. Well, the, the Metrons are in there, and I didn't need to have that in there, but I just figured, well, I'll go ahead and do it. I, always, I like the Metrons. I like the idea of them not being done with humans, you know, because as the Metron said in the Tall New West, you know, we were thinking maybe you were deceiving us. Because the more we studied you, the more we realized, you're crazy crafty. You are so crafty, it's not funny. Maybe this whole thing was a lab of deception. You know, so we said, well, we set up another test in which you didn't know you were being watched. You know, in other words, a hidden camera kind of thing, where if you still say all the things you say on a hidden camera, you say something different, you know, says the Metron. And then they were saying, well, we're, we're, this is awesome. Anyway, so they said, well, because you passed this test, even though you didn't know you were being tested, says the Metron. We're going to let you in some, on some information. There's something you must be told. You know, the Federation must know. And I never said what that was. That was going to be picked up in a story later. And I can mention now because even if it comes out, people aren't, it's not going to necessarily be spoiled. But basically, there's an extra galactic intelligence, a horrible intelligence, you know, a huge intelligence that basically is going to move into the Alpha Quadrant and Beta Quadrant and basically threaten all the sentient races. And it's something that's so insidious that you know, they're going to have to team up. So what it has to do with is these aliens or whatever, this race, they can actually inhabit people, ride them effectively, you know, so that they can make anybody do anything. It's undetectable. So if the Federation or the Clinton Empire or were infiltrated, no one would trust anybody because you wouldn't know your wife isn't instantly some alien riding or doing things. You know, you could never trust anybody ever again because nothing could test you. It was worse than ever when the uh, DS9, they were wondering if the founders had infiltrated uh, Starfleet. Of course, they had, and also the Korean Empire, but they found a test for them. You know, you can actually test them by the blood, whatever. But, you know, imagine if it was undetectable. Literally, you couldn't. Well, it would destroy the, the fabric of society, you know, and the Federation and all those and civilizations would fall. So, basically, Kirk is actually called... Um, He's kind of called by Section 31, but Section 31 is basically not like you know, doing some nefarious stuff. Basically, he's pulled into the Section 31, and it turns out, of course, he has some association with Section 31 from before, because, you know, as a captain of his stature, he would have rubbed shoulders with Section 31 sometimes. Anyways, so he basically has to contact the Klingons, and Section 31 needs to contact the secret Klingon equivalent, which is a hidden blade, you know. And, of course, the Klingons deny that, you know, that, that's anti-Klingon, you know, you can't hide a blade, you know, it's, that's an insult, you know, and have a hidden blade, your blade's always out, you know, Klingons speak proudly and they don't whisper and stuff like that, you know, so it's anathema to the Klingons, but of course, if they're going to be a space-faring race and be as successful as they are, they must have a secret police or a secret society, just like the Tal Shiar for the Romans. So based on that assumption, Kirk sets up a way to interest the secret Klingon, the Klingon KGB. And so he basically he does some things, and basically he does it in such a way that the final thing he does, he basically sets up certain purchases here in the secretly, whatever, you know, a secret is to make him, but no, he knows that they'll be detected. Secret purchases certain materials, which only someone who knows about forbidden technology that's been banned by the Klingon and, and, and around, around it's kind of like closing technology, you know, it's like banned between the Federation and around us. Well, this technology is basically, you know, a certain kind of weapons technology, which is very, very dangerous. It's banned by the Klingon and the Federation. But if you do that weapons research, there's a certain kind of radiation that comes from it. Well, Kirk basically buys up these chemicals, which in the proportions, so that it's clear that the Federation is getting ready for radiation of this sort being, is to treat that kind of radiation poisoning from this, this hidden weapon technology. So who would pick up on these clues? a Klingon secret police would pick up on it. So basically the last shipment of this thing is on this one asteroid. So Kirk's there waiting till some Klingon beams down to say, hey, what's going on here, you know? And it's Kang who beams down. And basically Kirk then tells him, it's like, hey, we have to team up, and this is why. So that thing that the Metron was telling was going to hint at the Klingons and the Federation and the Romans are going to basically have to team up to uh, 
just the worst. The, the whole episode was just setting up and meeting with Kang and, and explaining it as opposed to the whole thing that comes afterwards. But anyways, it was just kind of an elaborate setup. But I figured I was going to do the Metron anyways, and I just figured, oh, I'll just have him say this. So he says, there's something you must be told. So I just threw it in there just for fun. But a lot of people don't notice that. So now the something you must be told, we now know what it is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that was the elevator pitch, everybody. Very long elevator. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Well, thank you, Kurt. You know, obviously, you put a lot of work into your various animated fan films, and they are very unique in the community. So hopefully you will continue to give us more. I wish you luck in the future. I'm very happy that you found another lady love in your life. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm very, very happy. Very, very happy. And anyway, as soon as you have another animated episode ready or soon to be ready, just you know, give me a call and we'll have you on again. Great. Well, thanks, John. And also, I wanted to uh, give you kudos. The trailer for Interlude is awesome. And I love how you use the Space 1999 theme. I'm watching the uh, Space 1999 all over again. It's very, very clever use of that because it's like everybody knows that music and the pacing of it is very, very creative. I like that. So kudos on that. Oh, well, thanks. It was it was a lot of fun to do. Some people thought it sounded like 70s porn, but, you know, for those of us who actually were alive in 1975 oh, watching yeah. Space 1999 okay. every week, that music is sort of near and dear to our hearts. Very cool, very cool. Anyway, thank you again for your time, uh, of course. and uh, okay, best of luck to you. I appreciate it, Jonathan, and anytime you need anything from me, just give me a holler. It was nice sharing an uh, afternoon with you.